Good evening, everyone. It's Tuesday, 12th of May, and <clears throat> we're delighted to be welcoming you back after a weekend break for session number 12 of Live from Reference Bar, brought to you by Barnsley Football Club Sports Trust. We might be short of live football right now, and rightly so, until guarantees are in place that everything, everyone involved will be safe. But we're working tirelessly to bring you a variety of guests connected to Barnsley Football Club in some way, either on the pitch, in the dugout, or in the boardroom. We hope you find these entertaining and insightful to watch as they are for us putting them together. Um, and tonight we've got someone from the Academy of the Pitch and the Dugout. So joining us in our virtual fan zone bar is a former Red who, just like Paul Eckingbottom, saw promotion from League One with Barnsley as a player and then was part of the first team coaching set up as recently as last season. He's now coaching north of the border in Edinburgh with Hearts and he's still only 35. Good evening, Dale Tong. <laughs> good evening. Thanks for the introduction. Everybody okay? <laughs> All good, mate. All good. Firstly, from us, congratulations on the new arrival. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hard work, but um, enjoyable. Well, you've probably been thinking what lockdown the last couple of weeks, I imagine, with the sleepless nights. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been quite fortunate for me, to be honest. I've, that, that's the positive I've took from it. Um, obviously, seeing, seeing the birth of my baby um, and then at the same time, um, actually being able to spend the time with, with my missus and, um, and the baby because... As we know, football doesn't stop, and um, I'd have probably had a couple of days off, and that have been back back at it. So having um, an extended period has been brilliant for me. And have you had to juggle parenthood with trying to understand the drama taking place with the SPL and Hearts? I mean, what what's happening up there is a little bit sh- a, a bit a little bit strange at the minute. Um, obviously, everything's getting played out um, in the press, which obviously isn't ideal. Um, but at the same time, it's it's probably the sign of the times that everything's being played out as it is, and nothing's in house anymore. So uh, it's just a case of getting on with it and um, hoping that, from our point of view, it, it, we come out um, okay. And do you speak directly to Hearts, or does Daniel just call you with all the updates? Um, it's a little bit of a um, little bit of everything really. There's a little bit of communication from the club. There's a little bit of communication from the head of comms. Um, obviously, the, uh, Daniel himself. So it's kind of a um, like three or four way conversations. So yeah, it's, it's okay. The com- communication is good. Um, it's like I say, I think just from our point of view, we won't like it out as in the press as much as what it is. No, I can imagine that. And, and what view do you take on how the season should finish? Personally, obviously, I'd like it to finish. But at the same time, um, health is more important. So um, I don't think we should be in a rush. Um, if there's an opportunity to finish it, great. But if there isn't, um, I think I'm, a, I'm an advocate of the of the chairman's where this circumstance shouldn't should no one should be punished for all these circumstances because it's uh, obviously it's a pandemic. It's a, it's a worldwide, um, and it's not some of that any any anything's made. It's just a case of um, it's a situation we're all in. So no one should be punished for it. It should be a case of um, can we all work through it together? We have common goal. Um, and like I said, no one should um, be a detriment to this. It should be a case of moving forward and everybody should hopefully prosper in the future. Yeah, and I think that's a similar view that's been shared by uh, Struber at Barnsley as well in terms of playing fantasy football with the remaining games and all that. Yeah. Um, well, look, the, the way we approach these interviews is an hour of questions going right through your career from start to today, mm-hmm. which takes us back to a Barnsley-born youngster coming through the youth ranks at Oakwell. How old were you when you joined Barnsley Football Club? Um, I was I was just coming up to eleven. Um, I was in the last year. Of, um, it was you know the centre of excellence. Yeah. So was, there was no academies then. Um, we was in the last year before obviously all the renovations started with the academy. Obviously all the Ashley Ward money uh, was coming through. So um, we was the last year of that, and then it came into the academy at twelve year old. So um, yeah, eleven officially, but twelve into the academy. Th- what twelve thirteen it was. And what and what players can you remember growing up with when from the twelve to sixteen time? What is in my my years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. just in terms um, of who so you're playing ones, with. So the ones that people obviously know is like your Robbie Williams and your Nicky Rose. They were my ages. Um, a couple of people that probably should have done a little bit better that, that never actually got the opportunity were probably Adam Oldham's and um, Ashley Scovens. Uh, Ashley's obviously made his yeah. debut. At, I think he made his debut at Forest away, I think he was. Uh, we had quite a few unfortunate breaks. Um, it was really unfortunate to curtail his career, really. And then obviously the obvious ones are Austin, K, Parkin, all them lot, uh, your Fallons, uh, all your all your Maoris. So yeah, they were all obviously older than me. But um, that that line of probably four to five years from early two thousands was a was a real stream of players coming through for for the club. Yeah, yeah, you just named named a few of them. Those like going back down memory lane. Um, mm. Obviously, you play for different coaches as you go through the ranks. Can you can you remember the coaches you played under and which one had the biggest influence on your career? 
Yeah, yeah, I remember them all. We um, it, it were a little bit different to what it is now, where you have a different coach every year. Um, we had one coach who was with us for a while, and Matt Burton. Obviously, the fans and, and yourself will know Matt very well. He were a massive influence on me. Obviously, he had to retire quite early, so he still had a massive, massive love for the game, but still could equally move as I think he was 26, I think he was when he was coaching us. It was him and Shirty. Um, obviously, that was obviously Peter's brother. Um, I mean, God rest his soul, he's not with us anymore, but them two as a pair were absolutely unbelievable. Enthusiasm, energy, um, and obviously a thirst for uh, youth football, and they were brilliant. And like I said, they helped bring those players that I've mentioned through, and um, they were massive, massive parts of it. And the next one was probably, who was the big influence, was probably Mark Smith in, into the Scotland years. Oh, yeah. um, Smudge was unbelievable with us. He was, he was as honest as they were. It, it, everything was straight down the line. Um, no ifs, no buts. And it, it, it helped us because, obviously, we're from a working class area. And um, he knew the values of what people wanted to see if, if we were fortunate enough to get into the first team. And I think they're the, they're the values that not only Bunny and Shirty, but uh, Smudge brought through and... I think that's why we were so successful in them years. And then speaking of the first team, so your league debut came against Brentford in April uh, 14, I think it mm. was. Before we ask about that game, how long were you knocking on the door of the first team? Um, it, it was weird. It was quite, I mean, I was, I was only built like a rake. Um, and it was quite quick. Hearty just, um, he got us with the, it was different then. It wasn't um, a 16s, 18s, 23s. It was a 17s, 19s reserves. Um, and at the time, like I said, quite a few of us were doing really well uh, for the 17s. So we were playing 19s and in the Pontins League as well. So Harty just got um, myself and Robbie up training one day. I mean, I was only seven, oh, 16 at the time. Um, um, he just took over. Hodgy, what uh, caretaker manager, if you remember, Glyn Hodges. Yeah. Um, he was the one who got us with us to start with. And then Harty kind of took that on. And it was only a couple of months, really, of probably three or four sessions, got absolutely wiped out by Morgs and Crooks in the first two, first two sessions. Like, don't start, I, mean, I won't swear, but obviously pick me up, like scruff of my neck, get up, you're fine, get on with it. So obviously a little bit of a bats in the fire, but Harty kind of loved the fact that I just got on with it. Um, and like I said, a, a few months later, um, I was I was training with him uh, more regularly. And how did it feel when you made that first appearance in the Barnsley shirt? To be honest, I didn't really have time to think about it because um, I, I, I didn't know I was going to be in the squad. Um, very similar to my actual full debut, really. Um, I was just, I was cleaning my boots. I was actually late. Um, Hartley was in the dressing room and he went mental at me because I was late. I was cleaning Crooks' boots. He weren't happy with him. <laughs> Big, horrible size 13 tempos. So I had to run back up to the boot room to clean his boots. And then as I've come back in, um, he went, he, but he went, he went mental. Say, come with me. So I thought, oh my god! I thought, I thought I would have been squad, and then I thought, oh, I'm out of it now. Anyway, he took me around to his office. Him and um, him and Stitch, Andy Ritchie. Um, he went, how are you feeling? Uh, I said, oh, I'm really sorry. He went, right, you're going to be on bench today, and you're probably going to get a game. I was like, oh. So I thought I was going to get a rollicking, and end up. Um, it was just a, a way of him kind of settling my nerves, not giving me time to think. It was clever, really, when I think back. Um, so I didn't really have time to get nervous. I just, I was just like a bit. A bit gobsmacked really and then just enjoyed it from there and it was only about 10-15 minutes but um, and at right back as well some, some a position I never played at that point so it was just um, it, it were good it were good and you mentioned Paul Art a couple of times he, he was the one who gave you your debut mm. famous for bringing young players on at Forest how, how did you find playing under him as a youngster? He was brilliant for us as youngsters uh, like I say he wasn't afraid to let us mix uh, with the first team boys who obviously we had a very experienced team at that point um, Harty brought quite a lot of experienced boys in um, so I think he felt it was a good uh, opportunity to bring the young players through and obviously learn from the older players so whether that be even involved in training or just away trips he'd take us on away trips uh, just to get used to the changing room what's, what's the bus like making cups of tea so keeping you grounded um, it, it was really really clever was Harty uh, amount of times I had to wash his car while I was still playing for the first team was unbelievable um, but I got my own back on him one day, so that, that was uh, that's another story. Uh, but yeah, he was really, really good, really good for the young players. Well, we had Rick Alden and Andy Rich on a couple of weeks ago, which was entertaining, as you, you can probably imagine. Um, obviously, Andy had close links to the academy before, but Rick spoke really, really highly of you as a player. Um, okay. How were him and Andy Rich as a coaching team, and how did that change versus Paul Hart? Um, chalk and cheese, chalk and cheese. Hart, he was he wasn't a disciplinarian, but he was disciplined. 
Um, he liked things a certain way, um, but at the same time, he was quite innovative. So he was ahead of his time, really. Uh, and the things he was doing, the stuff he was doing, was really, really, um, really, really, like I said, past his time. But it was, it was more how he did things. He had a respect, and a, obviously, he was a big name in the game at the time. Um, obviously, famous for bringing the, all those Leeds players through, but at the same time, done a really good job at Forest. So he was a big name, and uh, like I say, he had a bit of an aura about him. Um, Andy and Rick were different because Andy had come. Andy was with us at the academy a lot of the, us younger players so we had a it was tough amount of times he find us younger players because we used to call him mate or Andy or Stitch and it was so hard to get out of calling him these names and not calling him gaffer so um, yeah that was a, that was different but at the same time Andy and Rick just relaxed you they relaxed you it was just so it was an environment where you just loved going in every single day. You were we your mates, similar stuff. Like I say, a lot of that by that point, end of that season when Andy kept us up, um, a lot of the older players moved on. So the, it was obviously, as we know, it was a very young team, and even the players that they brought in were still a good age. I think, I think apart from Colgs who was in at thirty, the rest and Maka who came in through high, the rest were below twenty-five. So. Um, like I say, it was just a group of lads enjoying themselves, coming in for a kick about every day, learning a bit. Um, and just like I say, I had big, big smiles on his face and, and they created that them too as a pair. They were a, <laughs> they were a rarity. To, like, I don't, I'd love to see how they'd cope now with uh, with some of the young players coming through. Who, um, attention isn't always on the game. It might be on certain aspects away from football because they were massive advocates of being students of the game. That's not to say players aren't these days, but they've got other interests. Uh, your Xboxes, um, things off off the pitch. They've got different interests. Where I think we were quite, um, I want to say commoners, but we it was football. That were it. It was just football. So uh, they they were big advocates of that. Watching old football. Rick was massive on the old Argentinian games. Uh, um, he loved like Matty Stewart, Ricky Vieira. He loves all all them our dealers and all them. He loved them all. So it, it, they were really really good as a pair. And like I said, they they brought the group. Um, who, I'm not gonna say we were misfits, but we weren't a group that were ever together. Uh, but they brought it together in a unique way. And it was like I say, it was just a joy to come in every single day. There was something going off every day, whether that be laughs and jokes, pranks. Uh, but when it was football, it was football, and it was it was a it was a brilliant time. And I, I'm sure you'll if you speak to many people, it was probably the best time of their careers. And how often did they call you a jerk? <laughs> That's Rick, that in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was his nickname for me, Jerk. Uh, I, I was never serious. Um, I would, always, I would, I would, I would, like I say, I like to have a laugh and a joke. Um, obviously, him being um, head physio, and the, he used to call himself the Were, which were just an horrible monster. Um, he was a dis, he was a disgusting human being. Um, things came out of every orifice. Orifice. He was a disgrace. Uh, but we had some good times. Really good times. Top man. Really top man. That, 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 that kind of looks in line with uh, the video that we had with him two weeks ago, if that makes sense. Uh, look, the playoff final at the Millennium Stadium, that was that was your biggest game to date at that point. Um, mm-hmm. You're on the bench, you come on for Howie. Yeah. How did that feel with the game so finely poised? Um, it, it was a strange one, actually, because um, building up to the game, obviously I'd played most of that start of the season until my injury in January. Um, and I actually didn't think I was going to get back for the, for the playoffs. But I managed to get back even before I got back for the Walsall game, the last game of the season. Yeah. Uh, so played that and then um, still wasn't quite right. And Andy made the right decision not playing me because I wasn't right for the semis. He played Aussie and uh, obviously Bobby was fit as well then. So yeah, he had obviously good options, but at the same time, I wasn't right. So um, it was interesting because I think it was between me and Robbie who was going to be on the bench. Um, and he eventually chose me. So it was a strange situation because we both said, I mean, me and Robbie were best mates. So said like, look, whoever's on the bench, whatever appearance or money, if we win, lose, or whatever it is, we'll split it. Um, so that's what we did in the end. We, we, we split it. But during the game, I was actually thinking of him quite a lot, thinking, God, he should be here. He played, he played a lot that season as well. Um, but again, he got an injury. So I was thinking of him a lot. So when it came, I was actually... I think around half past, uh, around half time, someone was struggling. Um, how we got hurt quite early, uh, but he obviously soldiered on, got to around, like I say, around sixty. But from fifty minutes onwards, I was warming up, and and it, the nerves were pumping there. And it weren't anything in terms of um, nerves of getting on the pitch. It was just pure nerves of 
desperate to get on and help me team, help the boys because we, we were getting battered. Uh, so that's all it was really. Um, it's just one of them things. I was nervous, but it, it, good nerves and angst. And I think obviously I showed that in the first five minutes. So I was, I was going to say, what's, what's going through your head when it could have been two yellows? I don't know, absolute head loss. I can't say what else, absolute head loss. I can't even remember it. I can only remember the second when I should have got sent off. Um, I, I remember looking at Trevor Kettle and I've said it, I've had, it, I've had a bit of banter with him a few, uh, throughout the years, like while I've been playing. And um, I just have big puppy dog eyes. I mean, I must have been looking like I was going to cry and he probably just felt sorry for me and said, look, I can't send this kid off. Look at him, he looks like he's going to ruin. So, um, and I did, I looked up and I was on my knees and I thought, this is it, five minutes, I'm off. I've cost team game. And I, I genuinely thought that, but I just had a massive head loss where I don't know what was going off. I just had that much adrenaline going through my body. Uh, wanting to impress my family, all my family, they, all my mates were there. Obviously being a local lad, it was like a massive thing. Um, but like I said, I can't say what was head loss really. And, and the scenes after the game were unbelievable because obviously going up going up via a penalty shootout is probably the, the best emotion you can get. Can you remember much of it as a, as a young player at the time? Yeah, clear as day. I, we'd um, we'd done loads of we like I said the. I think Andy and um, and Rick sometimes get a little bit of a, um, a stick because of how jovial things were at times, but they knew the details that needed to go into. We practiced penalties for for a long time. Um, run ups, long run ups, short run ups. Uh, boys just hammering each other. Um, and I, I, like I say, if you, anybody who's watched our penalties, we would have can. No one would have put those four people up to take a penalty. Not what, not hardly anybody. But every one of them looked composed, and it were only through practice. Um, and obviously, the boys knew where they were going to go. They practice it. Uh, we've been in obviously not that scenario, but we tried to um, make it as real as possible. And um, that were down to Andy and um, and Rick and, and the rest of the staff. They they provided that scenario for us, and and it were brilliant. And it proved it proved its worth because, um, like I said, I don't think anybody missed to be honest. And, and whilst breaking break, breaking the team was difficult because, as you mentioned, there's a lot of good players in that squad. Um, but they obviously believed in you. Was it then a surprise to see Andy and Rick move on so quickly the next season? Well, obviously, there's um, there's a lot of things that went on behind the scenes, and um, I'll be totally honest. I, I disagreed with it, and so did the rest of the staff, staff and, and players, especially. Um, it was, in my opinion, it was bang out of order. It wasn't something that, that was just. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not privy to all the ins and outs, but um, I know there's certain things that went on that, in my opinion, is quite distasteful. So um, they should have been given more time, especially considering the start we had to the season. Uh, we were in a decent position, um, and even at that point, when, they, when when obviously they got the sack, it was October time, I think. Yeah, right. yeah. Just at the end. Um, I mean, it was it, it, it was madness in my point of view, considering what they'd done um, on a, on on a shoestring budget as well, and we were competing with some big big teams in the champ, um, and all in his own. So yeah, I, I I didn't agree with it, and like I said, ne- neither did the rest of the boys. And, and 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 taking that feeling, how was it? How hard was it then transitioning to Simon Davy, seeing seeing Andy and Rick leave? Um, hmm. I wasn't Simon's biggest fan. Um, he wasn't my cup of tea. Um, he was quite. I found him quite dishonest. I'll be totally honest. I found him quite dishonest. He, he wasn't honest with me. Um, he froze me out. Um, I think it was quite obvious at the end of that season with how many of the uh, local boys they actually got rid of. Uh, that were integral to the to the core of the, the not just that team but the club as a whole and what represented as, as Barnsley. Um, he, he he got rid of that that core very very quickly because if I, I remember him having the conversation, he felt it was going to be more powerful than him, uh, which like I say, it baffled me as a younger player because um, all I wanted to do was play football. Uh, but obviously he had ideas of grandeur, um, and like I say, I think it was the wrong decision in my personal opinion. Um, but the club made the decision that they did. Um, Andy and Rick were no longer there, and then um, Simon took over. I obviously had some really good moments uh, for the club, and I was there watching with them. Like I said, the FA Cup runs, stuff like that. So it was, like I said, I know that's good from a fan's point of view, but uh, from my point of view, it was a little bit distasteful, to be honest. And, and just just going to when Simon Davy got the job, I know you came off the bench really late in that three 0 defeat at home to Wednesday. Um, we didn't play very well, you know. You talk about Robbie Williams, he had to play central midfield out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, really. massive argument about that on the Friday. Right. Uh, and then one the Friday actually. It was a it was a it was over is that New Year? Um 
can't remember what, whatever did, whatever time it was. I remember we had a, he actually put Robbie in my position. Um, I know I'd just come back from a little niggle, but he put Robbie in my position. That's probably when I knew my end was coming, to be honest. Uh, just because of how he handled the situation, he put he put a left back in a position that he'd never played before, apart from a new football, um, and he made a point of doing it in training um, when he knew I was fit, I was ready to go. Local derby, you don't you don't do stuff like that. Um, but he made that decision as the manager. Um, it, it it wasn't proved uh, to be the right decision. Um, although Robbie actually had a better game than most, um, and I just I, like I say. It, a lot of the stuff we signed left was really, really uh, left a bit of taste in my mouth just for the fact that um, how we handled the whole situation, not just with myself, but with the rest of the local boys. Um, he wanted to get rid of us quite quickly, which was a shame. And, and obviously Rotherham was where you ended up when you left Oakwell. <clears throat> was, that, was, was that a deliberate ploy to stay local or was that just the, the best team that came in for you and the best fit? No, um, like I said, uh, be- before... Um, before all this happened, obviously I was um, in negotiations with the club to sign a new contract. Um, and like I said, when the Wednesday game happened, I asked, the alarm bells started ringing. Um, and I had opportunities to go on loan to uh, some big clubs uh, who were challenging um, at the time. Uh, one, it was Forest, um, who was it? It was Blackpool, Forest, Blackpool. I think the other one was Yeovil. They all ended up in the playoffs um, and Simon wouldn't let me go there. Uh, because they had a chance of getting promoted, um, so I can't. So obviously that all that got curtailed. Uh, negotiations kind of just fell on deaf ears, if I'm being totally honest. And I was actually on a golf. I went. On, I went to Gillingham on loan, and I went on a golfing trip with those boys. Um, and I, I out the blue, Mark Robbins rung me up saying, "Look, will you come? Will you come and play for us? Um, I'd love you to play for us." Um, and just kind of sold it to me, and it would. It was a difficult time for me, if I'm being honest. Uh, my mum wasn't very well. Um, she had a um, she had a bad illness at the time, so um, I kind of count count my blessings because I was able to stay at home, um, look after my mum, and um, yeah, it were it were it were fortunate the fact that Mark run quite he run quite late actually in the window, um, and as soon as he rung, I had a chat, I'd, I'd, I'd met him, and I, I think I signed the day after, to be honest. And you played over 150 games for Rotherham, with your last season being the one where <clears throat> I think runners up in League Two under Steve Evans. He's such a famous, shall we say, character. We can't not ask what it was like to play for him. Um, I got paid up every week. <laughs> <laughs> All honesty, I got paid up every week. <laughs> the man's a lunatic. He's an absolute lunatic. Um, yeah. It, it, like him all love him, he's obviously got an unbelievable record, but I hated him. I hated the bloke. He was the worst human being I've ever met. I can't be I, I'm I'm I can only be honest with people. He was the worst human I, I met some bad people. I'm from a I'm from an area where there's some not so nice people. Um and he's worse than a lot. And he was a football manager. Um str- <laughs> some of the things he used to do were unbelievable. I, I don't know how he got away with some of it, if I'm being totally honest, but he had success, so he kinda I want to say he got away with it because, like I say, he had a very, very successful period over about five or six years with, I think, maybe the same amount of promotions. So um, he was he was obviously highly regarded as a manager, but as a as a bloke, he was a, he was a horrible human being and a and, and a terrible, terrible creature around the just changing changing rooms and training ground. I mean, I never forget we uh, when we were, we were going for the measuring up for the suits for the playoffs. Um, he, he lost his head and tried to fire the tailor because he couldn't get his arm around him to you know to measure his suit. <laughs> <laughs> lost his head, kicked him out of the kicked him out of the dressing room, going mentally and trying to sack him. <laughs> what are you doing? That, oh, he was a oh, he's a crazy crazy blow, crazy blow. But do you know off the pitch, so intelligent, so smart. I know, and I think he had a career in uh, business before football ridiculously intelligent and you can see why you could charm any chairman a really really smart bloke and you could when you had proper conversations with him you knew what he was about and how he how he had that he had the pattern he knew exactly what to say and when to say it so I understood how he got in the position he got in and obviously the success he had uh, was partly because of that because he always had money to spend um, and he did he did a good job with it to be honest with you but uh, yeah, struggle to work for and struggle to work with, if I'm being totally honest. And I think you'd be far-fetched to find anybody who thought anything different. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Look, your career then took you to Torquay, Chester, Stockport, 
FC United and Manchester of, of all teams. And I think you were doing some part-time coaching at Oakwell at the same time as, a, as one of those last clubs or a couple of those last clubs. How did you end up back at Oakwell in a full-time role? I actually started the coaching at Rotherham. Um, one of my last injuries, the, the, the probably the worst one when I was out for over a year. Um, I went in with the 14s and worked with a bloke called the, uh, Sykesy and he was unbelievable. Um, and he actually gave me the enthusiasm to like crack on with it. Um, like I said, a lot of spare time. I was working a lot on my own, but on the weekends I wasn't playing, I wasn't doing anything. So I actually worked with the 14s and quite, I mean, Ben Wiles was in the first team. Now he was part of one of those groups that um, I actually worked with a little bit. I mean, I wasn't the, the proper coach. I was just um, working with Sykes and just overseeing what he did, how he worked, what he worked, what you football looked like, um, how you kind of built a week and then worked into a weekend's game. It was really, really good. And then the same at um, Torquay, I actually worked with the youth team there, did a few of my licences uh, while I was down there for a couple of years. So that was the main thing, got my licence done. Um, and then as I came back home, um, I, I was speaking to Bobby quite a lot um, and he, he said, look, if, I, if, we, if there's an opportunity, would you come? And I and obviously I'd, I'd jump at the chance, uh, but I was still playing full time then. So it was um, when the call did come, um, obviously went through the interview process, which I'd never done before, which absolutely crapped me up, if I'm being totally honest, because I'd like I said, never done before. It was suit and tie presentation, never done it, absolutely massively out of my comfort zone. So that was difficult, but I had a big decision to make. So I actually went part-time for two years um, just so I could work back at the club. Um, and I thought I was trying to think long-term, thinking, right, okay, my body's not packed up on me yet, but there's an opportunity where <laughs> this could pack up at any time as women needs being as bad as they were. So I took that decision to play part-time, short on my football career, but actually hope longevity in, um, in my coaching career. And what was the first role you had back at Oakwell full-time, job title-wise? Well, I actually interviewed for the the foundation phase. That um, one of the one of the staff members left, so I interviewed for that, and I got that job. But two weeks later, um, the lead uh, lead YDP, so the lead twelve to sixteens coach left. Um, so I interviewed again because um, I did want I didn't want to work with the I, I, I didn't mind working with the younger players because I know you need to learn, and it's something that um, I'd always encourage. I mean, being in that process now, working with twelve to sixteens. I would start at the bottom because I think that's where you do all your learning. Um, I did all my learning with them. Um, and then, like I say, I interviewed for that, got that job then as assistant YDP, working with, with um, Andy Oldsworth and Tom Arben, some good people there. Um, and that's where, it, that's where it all stemmed from, really. And then, and then when you came back, com- compared to when you, were here as a, when you were here as a player, did you notice any changes in the setup, the academy or, or anything like that from when you were there before? Um, the setup was the same in terms of um, the the facilities because that were all done when I was there. Um, but the the academy and the system itself had changed entirely. Um, there was more coaches, more things for you to do. It was very um, interactive, so it wasn't just driven command everything like that. It was actually there was a lot of open dialogue. Parents were invited in. It was like totally the opposite to when I came through or when I was there as a younger player, it was kind of do, 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 do. Or can you do this? Can you do that? And parents just sat there and listened. Whereas it's a lot different now where parents are involved because they play a massive, massive part. So um, it, it's, it's changed. It's changed for the better, in my opinion. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's a fantastic academy. Um, I think over the next couple of years, there'll be some more players that are going to be produced because... Like I said, those those two people I just mentioned in Tom and Andy, we've been very fortunate over the last four uh, four or five years between us to be working with some really really talented young players. And this brings us up to around two years ago and the start of that journey we went on in League One with, in many fans' eyes, our favourite German. How did your coaching position progress to being involved with the first team? Uh, another random one, really. Um, I. I just come in from um, from a session. It was a day, I think it was a Tuesday day release. Um, uh, so the boys, it's like where the lads come in from school um, and they finish at like three, four o'clock. So it was around five o'clock. We were just packing up myself and Tom. Um, and Daniel walked into the office and he just said, oh, he went, Dungy. Uh, and he just said, <laughs> can I, and he was like doing that. He obviously, his English was horrendous at the time. And he was just like, can you, can you talk? And I thought, oh my God, what have I done wrong? So I'm thinking, right, boy, because the boys, obviously, when they're on day release, they do all the jobs, they do all that sort of stuff. Um, 
and I'm thinking they've, they've done something up, they've not moved goals or the balls are wrong or something anyway. So I'm walking and like takes me up into the office. There's no other staff there. Um, and he just sits me down and has a good conversation with me, really. Um, he had a conversation about my beliefs, uh, how I like to play football. It was a really open con- uh, conversation. And I had, I had no idea where it was going. Absolutely no idea. Um, and he just, um, like I say, in broken English, just said, obviously, he'd spoken to the staff. Um, they said they spoke really highly of me as a person and what I'd bring um, to, the, to, the, um, to the group, um, obviously, with the point where Andreas was moving on. So, like I said, at that point, I was still oblivious. Day after, I'm walking my dog like normal in the morning and I get a call, I think it was about 10 past nine. He says, you need to come in. You're, taking the, you're, t- you're helping with the session today. I mean, I'm like, I'm in the middle of um, Billingley at this point, uh, two and a half miles away from home. Well, he's on. It's horrendous weather and I, I'm, I'm start pegging it. Got to be in for 10, so I pegged it a couple of miles in my wellies. <laughs> Quite funny, really. I didn't obviously didn't have time to get changed. I literally got in the house, chucked some gear on, went straight to the uh, to the club, uh, straight into his office, sweating like a. Oh, it was embarrassing. So, he was like, "You okay?" I went, "No." I went, "You could have warned me." Um, anyway, he just laughed. He didn't understand a word I said because I said it that quick. Um, and he just says, "Right, okay." He says, "We're going to do this, this, and this today. Get changed. I'll introduce you to everyone." And that was it. That was it. And speaking to him later on, he said that obviously what we spoke about, he liked, um, he trusted the staff. I mean, we had a fantastic staff there. We said, you Vic, uh, Lou, Jack, uh, people like that. We had some really, really good people in there and pe- people that got added later. Again, he, tr- he trusted these people. So um, they obviously vouched for me and that's probably the main reason why I ended up getting uh, the job that I did. And you're obviously really close with Stendhal now. How much have you learned from him so far? <laughs> he's a, well, he's a, from from my point of view, I saw it from like I said, a selfish point of view. Not only to just help the club, I thought, wow, what an opportunity to learn. Um, he'd obviously took um, coached at the highest level, um, coached against some of the best teams in the world, against the best manager. I mean, his last game at Hanover was um, was against uh, Pep. Um, I mean, he brought that up quite often, to be honest. Pep, 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 Pep. So. Uh, but no, it was it, it was really good to learn from. He's a good coach. He's very enthusiastic. Drive sessions, so something I like to do. But at the same time, it was something totally new. Um, just how we trained, the time we trained, uh, the days we trained. Everything was not normal to, I suppose, British culture. So from my point of view, it was um, it was a big, big learning curve, and something that I'm still learning from today. And what's it like being in the dugout with him when he's kicking every ball and blocking every tackle on the touchline? <laughs> Well, he's a lunatic, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. He's a madman. You can't get any messages onto him. Um, he used to make me laugh. I mean, we, I used to have conversations with uh, with Jack and Nathan upstairs. Uh, they'd be on the, the in the gantry or whatever they were, they'd film in the game, and you would try to give him messages, and he'd end up just saying, "Just say it." It, it, it was that engrossed in the game, and obviously, it's the reason why the fans ended up loving him. Not only just obviously his his enthusiasm, but how he was. He kicked every ball. Um, and, the, and obviously he showed a, a, a passion and uh, that, that the fans love to see and he, he wanted to win and that was probably his biggest drive and his driver was that he wanted to win and he wanted to win at everything uh, whether that be on the pitch off the pitch I mean, we did quite numerous um, things off the pitch he never won one thing oh, what a baby he is by the way oh he hated losing <laughs> <laughs> hated losing but nah is it, he, he, he loves he loves it um, and that's why I think um, the fans he endeared himself to the fans and um, we were playing some fast, fantastic football at the time when you came in. So what was, how easy was it to get involved in that young team flying high near the top of the league? It was so easy. Like I said, I, I knew most of the staff. So from that point of view, that was quite easy to come in because um, I knew most of them on a personal level as well. So that was, that was quite easy. So they, they made me really, really comfortable. Um, but the players were a different class. I didn't see it as too much of a difference because um, the players were still young, so it was very similar to what I would be what I'd been working with um, in terms of the mindset. They just loved to learn, they wanted to work, and they just loved playing football. Really, um, they were a good, honest set of lads with some big, big talents in there at the same time. So it was so easy, and like I said, and when things were going well. Um, and I came in, it just became so, so easy, so, so easy. And the players were great with me because obviously they didn't have to respect me as much um, and they could have just, they could have absolutely fobbed me off, but they didn't. They bought into what I was doing. Um, I like to think um, I helped a little bit along the way. 
And we went on a 20 match unbeaten run after a, an absolute shocker of a, a loss at Wickham. Mm. How positive was the team environment at Oakwell when you're just going through the motions of winning or drawing every week and not losing? Yeah, well, I think that's obviously, there was a lot of things uh, mentioned about the unbeaten record. And I think, again, that was uh, probably Daniel's driving force that he wanted to win as much as possible. Um, and I think from 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 my point of view, I think that's why the players were as good as the, what they were, because he never let up. They were never, oh, we, we're coasting here, like let them just get on with the rest on the laurels. It was, it was constant day in, day out. Um, and, and the players knew that they couldn't let up. Uh, whether that were a down day, it didn't matter what day it was, he was on them constantly. Um, and I think that were obviously a big asset of his and it's something that drove the team forward and, and eventually drove them to uh, promotion. And, and as a coaching team, how do you celebrate and keep an eye on that Portsmouth game when we got promoted? Are you all texting each other or are you all keeping yourselves to yourselves? It was a strange one, really, because we... Uh, w- a few of us were having a conversation actually being about being together and a few ended up being, I think uh, there was Head of Media, Lamps, uh, Jack and Sedgy. They actually went together, I think, maybe Nathan as well. Uh, they were all together, but the rest of us uh, were just sp- uh, spread out and obviously as events unfolded, it was just, I, I mean, not I, mean, I don't care who they are, not one of us thought that Portsmouth were going uh, to lose to Peterborough and obviously uh, what happened with someone at the same time, it was like, it was crazy. Um, and... Since when it all kicked off, and um, I don't know who scored the goal for Peter at the time, it was just it was just mayhem, and that were it. Then once that happened, um, well, yeah, it just went it went off a little bit. It was good. <laughs> and look, I know we still had a chance of winning the title on that last day, but it didn't really feel like we were at the races away at Bristol Rovers, and I don't think the fans really cared either. Mm. But how difficult was it to prepare the players for that Bristol game, knowing there was still a chance of silverware and achieving something else? I don't think it was difficult at all. I mean, I know, I know, the, I know the performance probably wouldn't um, show that, but again, I think Liam getting sent off as early as they did didn't help. I think if Liam doesn't get sent off, we still win that game. Um, because there were some massive positives uh, before the game, like Debo were on for the Golden Glove. Uh, we were obviously on for the most clean sheets. I, I think, it, was it Liverpool we were jointly at the time? Someone like that. So yeah, yeah, there was in Liverpool top all season. Pretty yeah, much. so there were lots, obviously there were go- the certain amount of goals. Um, there were the unbeaten record. There were, there were quite a lot of things that were riding on it. And um, so I think it was quite easy. And a big thing for us at the time was actually Kiefer was starting for the first time properly. So there were some big, big incentives uh, to go and win the game. But obviously, Liam being a daft git, got himself sent off being stupid and that kind of curtailed everything. But it was a it was a great day, nevertheless. Uh, it was great to celebrate with the people who celebrate with. Um, and it was just, like I say, a culmination of all the hard work, especially the people behind the scenes that people don't see. Uh, like, like I just mentioned, the backroom staff, I mean, they're unbelievable, that lot. The the things that they do day in, day out, the, the undermanned, understaffed at, um, at that place, but they do two people's job between it. It's, they're, they're unbelievable, and I can't speak highly enough of them. So to get to celebrate with them on the pitch and the players all together was, was, was brilliant, so I never forget. Oh, that's magic. So, look, it's the summer of 2019, Championship Football beckons. Was it a relief to get that official contract signed for the for the coaching job in the summer? Ah, it was easy. It was easy, wasn't it? I was, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? I want you to stay on. Will you stay on? Yeah. OK, great. Then it, there weren't much more to it, to be honest. I had a conversation with, uh, with Dane at the time. Uh, the only thing I, I wanted, I wanted certain things, like just obviously I was... I'm being totally honest here. I said, look, I'm, I'm choosing to be a club man here. I said that my allegiances at the time um, with the club. I want to be here a long time. I know I've come up quite a lot quicker than I assumed I'd go myself. Um, I, I always had ambitions to work for the first. Um, obviously, that journey went a lot quicker than I expected, but I was still choosing club over um, the circumstance. And that made that massively clear that I wanted to stay at the club knowing what the what the game was about now and people leaving clubs quite soon. So um, that was the biggest thing that I put forward. Um, I think it was understood, but uh, in the end, it was something that wasn't probably, um, a, well, it, was, it, didn't, it didn't happen in the end. So it's just one of those things. And what, and what were the first things you and Daniel wanted to work on with the players to get them ready for championship football? Well, obviously, it was coming into a massive, massively difficult league as it was. Uh, the biggest thing we had to deal with was obviously continuity. We had an um, influx of players, um, obviously all new from different backgrounds. 
um, different countries. So it was it was it was tough. So the biggest thing that we had to do was, like I say, continuity, togetherness. So a couple of away trips, actually being away together abroad, trying to get that close knit um, togetherness through with the boys, uh, not just as players but as a staff as well. Can we get bonds, create bonds, and that's going to help us because we knew it was going to be a tough fight uh, for the rest of the season. So that was the main thing. Um, and then obviously with all those new players, it was implementing that style of play that Daniel were famous for um, and trying to get the boys to buy into it because it is quite an unusual style of play. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not that's unconventional, so it's not something easy to learn. Um, and that was the biggest thing. And, and speaking of new players... Mick McCarthy was on last week and he highlighted just how important recruitment is when you're in the championship yeah. um, or any division, really. Um, and obviously, it's a bit of a sore subject amongst Red fans. With recruitment being so key going up a league, was it a tough summer in that regard for us? I think if we're all being honest, yeah, of course it was. Um, the club have got um, their philosophy on how they want to recruit players, um, how they deal with things. Um, they feel it's it's successful and being successful um, this current model so hence why the, the, they're sticking with it and they think it, it's going to continue to work um, and, but at the same time um, football is not that easy they're still human beings so getting 12 new players added to um, a good group that we already had but at the same time knowing that these human beings know that they've just lost four of the best players in the span of the team so psychologically we knew we were, we were already um one step behind just because of this, like I said, the psychological effect, knowing that we've just lost as captain, as leader, um, and obviously all the way through the team, centre back, centre forward, at the end, obviously in Kiefer. So, four massive, massive players for us. Um, where I think if we're being totally honest, if they stay, um, or even if a couple stay, um, the, the club wouldn't be in the position they're in, in my opinion. I think uh, I think a few fans would agree with you. W- were we ever close to keeping any of the players that moved on? And did we get the targets that you and Daniel wanted, or does it not quite work like that, at Barnsley? Um, I think a couple were close to staying. Uh, I can't say all. I think a couple. I think a couple were too far gone by that point. Um, I don't know if we left things too late. Uh, but again, that's not for us as a coaching staff to deal with. That's the club. That's the club's philosophy how they deal with things. So it's not something I can really comment on because I don't know what went on fully behind closed doors. Um, there were obviously a couple of people that uh, Daniel highlighted uh, that that we, that we obviously managed to get. Resigning Mikey was a big thing for Daniel because I felt like obviously he'd done really well. It was, it was a reward for Mikey because he trusted him. Uh, but Mikey showed a trust in Daniel coming home from Germany as well as a young player. So that was a big thing. Um but then the signings themselves, like I say, it's, it's, a, it's a club philosophy. It's not, um, it's not always the head coach's choice. Um, the players are sometimes given um, or presented, let's say. Um, you get to see the players sometimes, sometimes you don't. And look, <clears throat> despite moving up a division, we were facing the favourites for the league. We had to blood in a lot of the new players that you talk about. And the sun's beaming down on Oakwell. Just how special was that opening game against Fulham? It was, I, th- I think it, it was a surprise. I think I think it was a surprise just in the fact that how, not just how well we played, but how we limited them to absolutely minimal things within the game. Um, obviously, yeah, you've mentioned the setting, the fans were brilliant and the boys were unbelievable in that first game and they just outworked a very, very talented team and showed their quality at the right time and fully deserved the win. It, it, was, it was a special day, it really was. Yeah, we're amazing. But then tough games followed. Results didn't quite go to plan. C- can you pinpoint what wasn't going right for us at the time and what you were doing to try and address it? I think um, I think a big thing for us is actually um, the fact that we had all the ball. I think those first 10 games, I think it was only Leeds, at Leeds and I think maybe one other, it might have been Brentford at the time, that was actually above us in terms of possession. We was really high on the possession stats team were dropping off, dropping off quite mid to low blocks um, and we were really, really struggling to break teams down and the amount of times we were getting counted on or, like I said, transition, there was a lot of times where we were getting done through our, our mistakes in possession um, and being in comfortable possession as well. So it was something that um, we, were, we were used to in terms of last season dominating possession 
Uh, but at the same time, we counter transition quite a lot on teams last season when they had possession. And it's something that we weren't used to as much. And obviously the difference being at the level above is when they do get them opportunities, they, they inevitably do score. And uh, we were getting punished on one and two mistakes. You think of the Wednesday game in the second um, in, in the second game, I mean, Cam never never gives that ball away normally. Uh, they go and score, uh, and then the, the, the other, like I said, there's there's little bits within it. It's just come from out our in possessions, really really simple play, not 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 really opposed, and we're getting uh, counted and, and and punished for them mistakes. And ultimately, that's the biggest thing about the championship. In League One, you're getting three and four chances. I mean, no one can say that we didn't concede chances in League One. We did. But we had an unbelievable back four and a keeper at the same time who was who was who was unbelievable that season. But at the same time, the the higher level of, uh, is, is is frightening to be honest. It's, it very rarely is one or two chances maximum. Yeah, it definitely feels like a punishing division when you sat yeah. in the stands. And, and look, the, the big the biggest defeat was the Preston one, um, and that was probably the hardest to take. But how low were the squad after that game? Yeah, it was. It wasn't. It's easy to say it wasn't the defeat. It was the way the defeat happened. Um, obviously, it was massively disappointed, disappointing from the fans' point of view because it looked like the players give up. I, I believe me, they didn't give up, um, but they just looked like they'd lost all the confidence. Um, obviously, that was a, a culmination of quite a few results leading up to that game, um, and we actually started the game okay. Uh, but again, one one mistake, one lapse in concentration, one miss um, miss time in challenge, wrong decision making, little bits all culminated in another goal, and then from that point it became a little bit of a calamity. If I'm being totally honest, and it wasn't like I say, it wasn't through any fault of the players that they, 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 they definitely still tried. It was just I think like I say, it was a it was a culmination of all those things that have happened in previous games, and the boys just lost every bit of confidence that they had. And it's a frequently used word, word when talking about um, Oakwell, but experience, is that when you're crying out for some experience, when the, the boys are struggling a little bit like that? Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know it was a question that was fired at me quite a lot in, uh, in pre-season by, uh, by journalists like, uh, do you want experience? And um, I tried to word it in the, in the best way possible, saying experience doesn't necessarily mean age. It can mean amount of games. Um, and I've been told that will be being diplomatic. Um, and I think in those situations, you, you do need some sort of nous. Um, and at the same time, because of the players that, that we had and the type of players that we had, they only knowed one way. They knew that how Daniel wanted to play. They knew it was gun-ho. They knew it was full-on 90 minutes. Um, 100% attack, attack, attack but sometimes within the game you need your leaders to just take a step back, can you um, can you take stock in the game and realise that you can't win every game, especially at that next level, so yes experience would have been nice um, but at the same time it wasn't it wasn't forthcoming in terms of the amount of games that these players that came in had played, so it was up to us as a, as a staff to make these players as, as close as we could and like I said build that togetherness that hopefully experience um, didn't pay the players a massive part of what he did. And then out, out of the blue to a lot of Barnsley fans, it was announced that Daniel had left. How did you find out and what did you think at the time? Um, well, obviously it was a, it, it came as a shock. It was a strange situation. Uh, we was all sat in the office. I think it was, it was a day off actually. I um, can't remember what day it was. It was a very, very strange day. I know the players weren't in. Uh, I've been sat around the uh, sat around the table with it with with the staff, and um, obviously things things happened. And the gaffer came. He'd had a conversation with um, the powers that be, and he came and said that obviously he'd be relieved of his duties. So obviously we were all shocked. Um, asked for reasons why, um, and like I said, we don't. It was um, it was a really really um, strange situation. Um, I know he's been speculating on quite a lot, but. Um, it was obviously a little bit gutting for us, and, and obviously myself uh, being being someone who Daniel brought into the into the group. And, and normally, the assistant coach is the one that steps in for the interim when there's a departure. Were you disappointed not to be asked to take over the first team? Um, I, won't, I won't say I was disappointed. If I'm being totally honest, I was. I was never asked. 
Um, I think it was something that must have been done behind the scenes. Again, it's something that I wasn't privy to. Um, so what happened behind this, I was never consulted about it. Um, obviously, when Daniel did leave, I was the one that had the, the closest bond with the players. I knew the players the most. Um, and I tried to obviously, when all this had gone off, say, look, if you need me, let me, obviously after um, they appointed um, Adam at the time, um, I said, look, if you need me to do anything else, just let me know because, like I, like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, a, I'm, I'm here a club man. Um, I want to be here a long time. I want to help any way I can, even though I'm absolutely devastated that you've let, uh, let Daniel go. So let me know what you need me to do. Um, or is it is it the time that you actually gave rid of me too? Um, to which they said, no, uh, things are a little bit up in the air, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that were it really. Yeah. So I never really consulted and you're touching it there, being a club man, but did you think at the time that your Barnsley, your Barnsley time was coming to an end? Or were you thinking you'd stay on in whatever capacity they needed? Needed you to? Um, I'm being totally honest. I, I, I had doubts, yeah. I had doubts. Just for the fact that um, certain things that happened and how they happened, um, being at, the, at that moment in time the most senior member of staff um, and not obviously being spoken to, obviously run, run massive alarm bells, hence why I asked the question, have I still got a job here? Which the answer was yes. But like you say, it wasn't a, it wasn't a convincing yes, in my opinion. But at the same time, the club had the club had made the decision. Um, I think they've gone on record now saying they've been um, looking at Gerhard for, for a number of years now. So I think um, it had Gerhard been available then, I think the, the, the answer might have been yes on your bike, mate. And, and how do you look back on that whole episode over a three or four week period? Well, it's obviously gutting because, uh, like I said, I um, I chose the club over over Daniel effectively in the, in the summer. Um, it's something that I made clear. It's something that, um, like I said, I reiterated quite a lot. Um, but the club, sorry, just turn that off. But the club. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to explain, to be honest. It, it's, it was just it was just a really really unfortunate situation where it meant me leaving the club. Um, but I like to think that I I, I am what I am. I I, I, st I stick to my values. Um, I, I, I do believe in being what you say you are. So I act what I am every single day. I feel like I'm an honest, hardworking person. And I felt like if I'd have, if I'd have stayed, I'd have gone against all my values and principles that. Um, that obviously have been instilled in me from my parents um, all the way through to what I am now. So it's it was a position that I didn't feel like um, I would have ever, ever been able to uh, be comfortable with. That makes a lot of sense. Well, look, no longer at Oakwell. I'm sure you'd have put your house on the next move, not being Edinburgh. Um, <laughs> but when Daniel landed on the Hearts job, was it always a plan for you to join him there? And was there a reason it seemed to take so long for you to get there? Um, again, um I never even had a conversation with Daniel at this point. Um, and I know the club, I had to mention something to the club because uh, they put a, a random statement out saying that I wouldn't be allowed to go and it'd be compensation and stuff like that. And I've not even spoken to Daniel at this point. So um, obviously that uh, didn't sit very well with me because it was a, it was a kind of a false allegation. Um, but again, um, Speaking to Daniel now uh, and about the situation, that was one of the reasons why it did take so long because Hearts were scared that they might have to pay compensation for me. So, um, yeah, it was a difficult situation. But at the time, it wasn't something I, I knew was going off behind the scenes. Um, I know Paul made a statement about uh, myself. I think it was Chris as well. So, um, yeah, the, the, the conversations were what they were. But as soon as January came and I knew um, I, I was free to go, I had a couple of conversations with Daniel early January. Um, I went up and watched a couple of games, saw saw the place, um, and obviously went towards the end of January. And it's something that um, obviously I'm really enjoying. Yeah, okay, I was going to say, how are you finding Scotland, and how does it compare to being in the Championship? It's totally different. It's totally different. Um, just the, the the layout, obviously, of the league, the amount of games you play in terms of playing different teams, um, only a couple of uh, sorry, three or four times. Um, yeah, it's. It's it's definitely different, but at the same time, it's something that's really enjoyable. And from again, from a selfish point of view, um, it's another great learning curve for me to, to keep learning from Daniel. But 
to go and work at a massive, massive club, um, which which it really, really is. Um, I'm being totally honest, it's a sleeping giant. It just needs now a little bit of impetus um, and hopefully a little bit of luck now with this current situation where um, they come out of it and, and I think the club can go from strength to strength because it's a massive, massive club. But at the same time, the reason why I loved it so much is because it reminded me of Barnsley. It had a, it, it, it's a massive club with... Um, a lot more workforce at the club, but it still had a family feel. It, it was family oriented. They all worked for each other. Um, and like I said, being where I'm from and obviously the, the, what's instilled in me as a person, it, it's something that really drew me to it. And, and it's a massive compliment I can pay to them because that's the thing that actually, not just Daniel, the, the club and how they treated me was, uh, was a massive reason why I went. Well, look, fin- final handful of questions before you uh, let you get back to being a dad. But just to just... Um... I'm going to ask you a few questions. We just need you to name the player and just give us an example of why you're naming them. So, as a youngster breaking into the first team at Oakwell, who was the flashiest first team player at the time? The flashiest? Yeah. Um, God, there was some bad gear. I'll give it. I'll tell you, I know how he came a little bit later. Uh, he, oh, he had some rascal gear, did Howie. Uh, so did Davers. Davers. Oh, he thought he was. He was some horrendous gear. Did Davers. Some. Well, he, he, hence the shiny. nickname Disco. <laughs> yeah, but now as, as I was probably coming through, we had some. Obviously, we had people like I remember, like remember Mark Tinkler and Robbie Van der Laan. Yeah. Oh my God! Some like wacky gear, like flower power, and just like obviously Robbie were a crazy Scandinavian. He had some awful gear, and, and Eric were obviously. A, uh, South African, and he had disgusting gear from me. Also, flashes with her. Sorry. Oh, and then, uh, who was the hardest working as you were growing up in the first team? Um, what, like I said, someone who, who really, really um, paved the way for us as younger players. And in the same dressing room, who was the joker? Um, Quite a few, to be fair. Um, obviously, Ozzy had got to that point then uh, where he was playing first team and he's thick as mince. Um, and then you had a few lone players like Chops. Chops might be the thickest player I've ever come across, actually. Michael Chopper. Um, he'd lose to himself in a game of cards and he often did. Um, uh, yeah, I probably uh, Ozzy's still the daftest. He's still the daftest. He's, he's a crazy cat. And then the same questions, but when you were the coach, so out of that young Barnsley team as we're going for promotion, who who tried to be the flashiest in the dressing room? They've all they all fancy themselves. I I mean I know they won't be listening listening to this, but if they do hear it, every one of them fancy themselves. I'll tell you, mirrors. I mean we had to buy air dryers, <laughs> mirrors. Every I mean they bought a lot. Every single one of them in mirror. It's embarrassing. Um, Carly loves it. Loved it. Carly loved it. Alex, Alex must have a thousand pair of trainers. I never saw him in the same ones. He fancied himself. Um, yeah, them two, them two up there. Cam again probably fancied himself as well. In fact, like I said, they all did. They all did. Honestly, it's unbelievable how much time we spent in the mirror. Sign of the times, I think. Sign um, of the times, yeah. Who was who the hardest working out of that squad? I think as a collective, I think like to say one more than the other. If I had to, I think just for what he did on the pitch, he probably said Alex. He set an example um, in training constantly, as did they all, to be honest. Um, Brownie was an unbelievable worker, which you see on the pitch, uh, but they all were. Cam again worked really hard. So they all did. They were all really, really hard workers. And again, I think that was a, a, a real. Um, Caveat for Daniel when he came in, he obviously he got he got fortunate with the group of players that he got um, in terms of just the right issues and application that they did day to day in training. So wherever he asked, they did, they all did it, and it was a really really uh, great group to work with, an absolute pleasure. And then the last one on that team, who was the biggest joker out of that squad? Um, Alex is a bit of a joker, likes to take the mic. Um, often when people are not watching though. 
Dimmy had a little bit, but again, I think he was more crafty than all else. He wouldn't he wouldn't do it when you were when you were ready. Um, who else? Yeah, probably Saddam. Probably Saddam. Yeah. And how different is that Joker of the dressing room element now versus 15 years ago? Worlds apart. Worlds apart. The things that used to go off, you couldn't see it today. You couldn't see it today. Um, it was borderline then. In fact, yeah, it was borderline then. It's like, no, yeah, no. That would never, 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 never happen nowadays. Uh, which, which, in fact, me telling us is a detriment to the to the game because there's some things that I think um, should 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 still go on in terms of just uh, the camaraderie between the boys, how they are. That's not to say it doesn't go off, but it's a different time now. Um, obviously, social media driven. Um, a lot of things, like I said, spent time in front of the mirror. I don't think we even had a mirror in our dressing room. <laughs> No, I don't think we did. Uh, but yeah, some of the things that used to go off, were, were, like I said, they'll live with me forever. Um, brilliant, brilliant time. Some of the things that went off. Um, so yeah, yeah, good time. And, and, and this is an easy one. Promotion as a player or promotion as a coach? What do you think? Well, Hecky said coach. I, I, do you know what? I listen, I listen to Hecky's um, and I understand why he said coach. But I think from my point of view, because I came in later, I'm still same player, just because of the people I was with, and the, and obviously the memories that we had, and the, like the culmination of the year before being a lucky a team lucky to not get relegated, to then a team of misfits really get coming from nowhere and ended up going up in the playoff final. Um, that was like I said, that that, that was special. Uh, equally was special just I mean to do it as both yeah, I feel very very lucky and uh, very fortunate being a fan and it's like I say some of that I look very fondly at well the last question obviously there's much greater immediate concerns in football but is a long is a long time aspiration for Dale Tong to get involved in management is that where you want to be eventually yeah yeah it's an aspiration um, when I don't think um as Eki alluded to at the time uh, in his interview, I don't think it's something that you can ever really be ready for when you when asked, unless it's something that's in in the pipeline where it's actually prepared at the club and you and you're the next in line. You get told that within good time, uh, but it is something that I would like to do in the future. Um, and like I say, it is something that I'm doing now. Like I say, working for the pro license, building towards um, everything I can to get myself geared up and ready for it. And it's something that I'm really really looking forward to. Um, see where my, what my future holds and obviously relationships are a bit strained right now but would the uh, first job in management preferably be at Oakwell <laughs> ah, would they have me <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't ah, listen it, it, you never say never to, to anything in football I don't think you can um, I've got some really 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 good relationships with people at the club still um, and like I said there's some really really good people still working there and um, I wish that club nothing but the best I still I still look after them I still speak to some of the staff daily and um, like I said from my point of view it's, 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 it's my club and it's something that if I got the opportunity to come back uh, later on in life I'm sure it's something that I'd think about uh, very strongly Well look, that's the final whistle that was a lot of questions but we got through pretty much all of them Yeah so, look, thanks, Tongi, for going through that hour with us in uh, such detail and such honesty. I know from the comments we get from Reds fans all over the world that people really do appreciate this time with the ex-players. So, mm -hmm. thanks to you, especially with the new board and everything, just for giving us an hour. No problem. No problem at all. Uh, for everyone else, we're back on Thursday at 7 o'clock, speaking live with Brendan O'Connell all the way from Calgary, Canada. No chance of anything going wrong with technology on that one, so fingers crossed. Um, we've also recently confirmed Darren Barnard for Tuesday 26th of May, and even more recently, literally in the last couple of hours, Brazilian centre-back Denis Souza has agreed to dial in from Belgium on Thursday the 28th of May, where we also hope to have some written words from Anderson De Silva to go along with it as well on that live stream. So exciting times. Dale, thanks once again, mate, and good luck getting some sleep, and I hope you get a positive resolution in the SPL and Hearts and everything that's going on there pleasure stay safe everyone and all best wishes yeah likewise stay safe everyone and we will see you on thursday <laughs>